Anyway, welcome uh, to our demystifying art lecture. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Um, it's a great pleasure for us to have Chris Zeke Hand here this morning. Chris is the curator with Alexandra uh, of this fantastic exhibition um, called Copy Collet, Copy Paste. And Chris is going to explain it a little bit more to you. And we have one of the artists, Kate Puxley, here as well to talk about her work. Um, Chris, for those who don't know, Zeke. Uh, ran Zeke's Gallery on Saint Laurent Boulevard for about 10 years from 1998 to 2007. He put on over 50 exhibitions. His mandate for his gallery was to offer emerging artists their first solo exhibition. So Chris has launched uh, many, many careers uh, and is very, very cognizant of the Montreal Art Review, which is why I asked him to curate a show of emerging uh, contemporary, young contemporary artists, not necessarily emerging because we has been around for a while, uh, but young Montreal artists who are really in the uh, avant-garde of today. Um, Chris also, uh, in his previous life, he's been many things, uh, manager of uh, RPM Records, or RMP Records. Um, he's on uh, CKUT Radio, he runs a blog, he's uh, on Facebook, he's everywhere, and uh, is an <laughs> freelance curator, <laughs> and he's been connected with the gallery for various things, was on one of our juries one year, and... Uh, yeah, I was thinking back, it was Michael Hunt, when uh, you showed some of his work here, I think, which is in right. 2004, that's was the right. first time. Was one of the, that's right, yeah. So it's a pleasure to have Chris, and he's going to uh, give you a fascinating book on contemporary art. Okay, Chris, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you all for coming out in such large numbers. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. That's a good hear, and uh, if you, anybody wants, there are a bunch of seats out in front. You can come closer if you want, but I promise we don't bite. I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't bite. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know if anybody saw the uh, title that I gave, but it's one of the things that, to me I find is, yeah, it's a little bit difficult is to me art should mystify, it should uh, bamboozle, it should make everything sort of like, oh my god, as opposed to trying to dumb it down, and that's where I sort of, sort of have difficulty with the series, but I recognize the series. And so what I'd like to do is take you through sort of, everybody has had a chance to see the exhibition, because I'd sort of like to take you through sort of well, not necessarily piece by piece, but uh, artist by artist within specific things on specific pieces about where I find uh, where I find my sense of wonderment, because that is the thing that drives me most about contemporary art, actually art in general, whether it's old masters, whether it's uh, prehistoric stuff, is that sense of wonder, that sense of discovery, that sense of, oh my God, this just shows me a completely different thing, or this gives me a new understanding of something, or there is where it's uh, just sort of like, I could never imagine doing something like that. And that's one of the things that I find difficult is where people just sort of, you know, when I had the gallery and go to museums, you realize people sort of stand in front of a piece of work for maybe about 30 seconds if they're real good, and about 10 seconds if they're not that interested in trying to get that engagement. It's the sort of thing where when I go look at art, for the most part, I try and sort of analyze it and look at it and say, so what is it, why is it here? And then once I have an understanding of it, then it's the sort of thing, and it's my understanding, because my understanding is not going to be the same as yours at all, not as, is not going to be the same as Kate's at all, or the art, any other artist. In actual fact, there have been numerous times when Kate and I have had discussions on what should happen and how it should happen. She always ends up winning, unfortunately. <laughs> not true. But yes, you do the art. <laughs> you make it. But yes, yeah, so it's uh, that's basically the idea. And let's start with Kate's stuff, which. I was first introduced to her uh, work by through the humongous drawing she does of Roadkill. And it is the sort of thing that you can see the two cats behind us, there are three more up front. Um, when you take any sort of um, thing and you just blow it up large, it becomes impressive. It's, uh, I was recently talking with one of uh, Edward Bertinsky's uh, assistants, because Ed Bertinsky makes really, really large photographs, and I said, big is good. And he wasn't quite, he didn't quite agree with me, but to me, it's when it's large, that you just are able to see 
much in much more detailed stuff. And it is where you take a look at the cat, you realize that there's no way a cat can be that size. And by bringing it up that large, it's the sort of thing it brings your focus, or brings my focus into stuff that I normally would not be paying attention to if the drawing was, say, of a life-size cat or anything like that. Then it's the sort of thing of realizing that they are roadkill. Uh, they are cats that have been squished by trucks and just sort of died unnatural deaths a little bit too early. You then realize that we're, uh, we're talking about having that knowledge, but seeing them on the paper, it almost is two different realities. It's this cat, while I know it's dead, it's the sort of thing that it could, for all intents and purposes, look like it is sleeping. Uh, this one could be looking like, uh, which one? It's playing some sort of game or something like that. And to me, it's playing with that sense of reality and sort of saying, this is what I know about it, but this is what I, it looks like and stuff. is always so, a way that I find terribly engaging, especially with two-dimensional work, which is large. It's then the sort of thing of, yeah, I can now ask you, because it was, was you started with the drawings first, right? It started with the drawings. Uh, and then how did you yeah. get into doing the animals? What was the progression to the well, three dimensions? It was, okay, it, it seemed like a natural progression because I was collecting these animals, I was working closely with them in the drawings, and and yet I was still just creating an image of this creature that I was trying to draw attention to, um, and yet it was still being returned you know, to the road, basically, or being buried afterwards. And I wanted to push further than the image of this creature. And so I thought, what better way than to actually use the raw material itself, which was the animal. And that's how it led into taxidermy. And for the taxidermy, you ended up having to go to? Yeah, I went to Calgary, Alberta. And I studied taxidermy with a commercial taxidermist there. And that in itself was a really interesting experience because it was, um, it was not the type of taxidermy that I wanted to do. In fact, it was an industry that I'm quite critical of. Um, but what was interesting about that experience was I sort of approached, I guess, these Albertans with a certain uh, judgment, perhaps. And they also viewed me as, you know, this artist from Montreal who was a little wacky and, you know, had these ideas about roadkill. And, after the entire experience, we, we realized that we weren't so different. We had knocked down barriers between the two of us. And that's a lot of what my work is about, is trying to, I'm using these animals as symbols to try to talk about our own relationships and how we, how we treat the other, be it another sentient being, an animal, or be it your neighbor, or somebody from another country, or another background. So. That also informed informed my art, I believe. Yeah. Cool. And yet, by the way, if anybody has questions at any time, feel free to pipe up. This is not really a formal type, or I don't feel it's that formal. And so, if we verge off onto a slightly different topic, that's fine. Fine by me. Um, yeah. To continue with the cats, uh, with uh, Kate's cats, <laughs> not cats, Kate's. Uh, to me, it's the sort of thing with the three with the three dimensional objects. It's the sort of thing where it does definitely uh, force you to uh, confront their mortality, by extension your mortality. Plus, it's also the sort of thing of in the one thing that fascinates me with regards to the uh, what called taxidermy data <laughs> is actually how it is done, and it is the sort of thing since the show is called uh, copy uh, copy paste or copy cut a. The whole idea behind that is to show that uh, what creativity doesn't happen in a vacuum, and it comes from someplace and it goes someplace. And so, it's with Kate, it's, the learning was slightly more formal, where she was in a classroom classroom setting. But it is where all of the art here, somebody learned how to do it, which was basically copying from their professors. They then paste, redo what the professors do, and then. Uh, which I'll take it a step further, which is then they, we couldn't quite figure out, stick and modify, it was copy, paste is way easier as a catchy phrase and so on, but it's really copy, paste, modify. And so to me, it's, yeah, if, it's, if anybody has any questions on how uh, you uh, taxidermy a cat, <laughs> yes? I'm dying to ask if you photograph the cats before you paint them. Before I do the drawings of them? Yeah. I take, yeah, I take a lot of photographs and sketches before and during the process. 
Um, also because, uh, and I discovered this early on, it's not that pleasant to be working on a drawing for a week or more and have this raw material, um, especially in the summer months on your studio table. Um, so, and when I, when I first started with the drawings, I was drawing the animals in the position that I found them. And uh, what I found was by putting them horizontally onto a white back, background, vertically on a white background, um, they looked as if they were, they were floating or they were transcending or they were in this moment between life and death, this suspension. And more and more I've actually, I'm, I'm manipulating the animals a little bit more. Um, also because I, I scoop them up, I take them back to the studio, I, um, they go into the freezer. <laughs> um, and so there's a little more uh, of my hand now in the positioning of the animals. But uh, yes, lots of photographs. Lots of photographs. When you, were, when you were positioning them, how do you figure out which is the, is there anything that makes one position for this cat or this animal better than another? You know, often, in, okay, I position them and then I, I actually don't really position them. So in a sense, I'll take them and I lie them on the table and generally the way that they naturally fall um, is the way that I will draw them on the table. So this cat that was stretched out, it had this, I don't know, it just lay so peacefully and it was a really beautiful position, I thought, and then I tried to play with the perspective of it. So. I'm not, um, I'm not propping them up in any way. I'm not trying to force them into a position that's not natural for their, their bodies. And then for the three-dimensional ones? <laughs> how do I do it? How do you, how do you, choose, <laughs> no, how do you choose the position? What, um, what, what makes you put them in that position? I think the, the falling cats, it was again this idea of, uh, of groundlessness or falling. And a lot of the taxidermy that I do do are animals in these positions of falling. Um, and I, they're part of a series called Sensa Terra, which means without earth or without ground or groundless. And um, the cats are slightly different because cats are animals that have been domesticated. Um, they live in our homes. They also end up on our streets. Um, and so they're, a, they're different from most of the roadkill that I do find, which are squirrels, raccoons, wild animals. Um, but I think what interests me is this collision between the industrialized world, the human world, and this wild world, and how more and more there's less space, there's less wildness for these, these creatures to live in. So this idea of groundlessness, of sensa terra, without earth, um, I, it's, uh, it's an environmental message, I suppose. And uh, yeah, so those are definitely manipulated by my hand in the position of falling or reaching out or twisting. So basically, so is the, you have theory, the idea, and then how to form them in so that that idea gets put forth as forcefully as possible. Yeah, yeah. And, but also, hopefully, as poetically as possible. Um, I, for me, I find art interesting when it provokes thought and um, reflection. Um, there is a philosopher, Roger Scruton is a contemporary philosopher, and he said that in the past it was the tasks of artists to um, take what was most painful in the human condition and redeem it in a work of beauty. And I think that's a really beautiful philosophy to try to take something that is perhaps uncomfortable, um, <laughs> the subject of death, um, or our relationship with animals, and to try to to try to um, present it in a way that is beautiful, but is still um, what's the word? provocative, I suppose. Um, How about we 